I don't remember a time when making art was not important to me. I was an only child, so creating drawings was not just a way to pass the time, but it was something I just thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, here's one of my earliest creations. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I was exploring the emotions of a panicked cat trying to sneak by a lot of sleeping dogs. <laughs> and I, I have my grandmother to thank for very carefully noting the date and my exact age, six months, seven years, uh, seven, uh, six, you know, for uh, posterity there. Um, I self-identified as an artist fairly young, and by the time I finished high school, I knew I was going into art. I spent over seven years in the visual arts building here on campus, and after eventually finishing my MFA, I decided to carry on with art education because I wanted to teach high school. And I vividly remember <clears throat> standing on the steps of the visual arts building and telling one of my fine arts professors that I was going into art education. And, uh, he had on his black leather motorcycle pants and his black helmet and his cigarette, his professor gear, and his cigarette in his hand, and he just gives me this dramatic eye roll. And seven years, damn it, Sarah, seven years. I don't care how much you love making your drawings. You're going to quit in seven years if you go into teaching. It happens to every artist that goes into teaching. And while not the most supportive <laughs> comment he could have made to me, ironically, it ended up being about the best comment he could have made because I spent... I, I consciously made the time and I made the space for my creative process. I, it made me set in motion a plan to always have the time every day and to create a space for drawing. And even, even when my husband and I were first married and we lived in this tiny apartment outside of Atlanta, I had this five by five foot utility room. I could fit my drawing board, my pencils, my radio, and that's it. That's all I needed to go in and out every day in the studio. And after transitioning out of graduate school and into teaching, I in, just started, initiated this process of, with these large-scale portrait, narrative portrait drawings. And I continued doing these drawings, fostering that process of working, while teaching for the next seven years. And in April, in April of 2001, my husband accepted a job in New York City, so we moved to New Jersey, which is uh, into a commuter town right outside of Manhattan. And I was eight and a half months pregnant, and we had moving boxes all over the house, and I set up the baby's nursery, and I set up my studio. I was prepared. And a few weeks later, we gave, gave birth to my first son. I was so not prepared for motherhood and all these emotions love and anxiety, am I doing this right, to all of it. And an interesting thing happened. My drawings ceased to become precious, these precious objects. I had this precious baby boy who I loved and nurtured and cared for. And the drawings became a process and not, not a final product. Um, about four months after our son was born, all those anxieties and emotions tied into childbirth became linked, connected with all the emotions of living outside of Manhattan in the wake of September 11th. Um, a commuter town, my husband's going into work every day, and for months there was this really heavy sense of insecurity and fear. So those became compounded and linked. And it was at that point that I stopped drawing these portraits and I moved into self-portraiture. I realized that I was drawing these models and I wasn't connecting to how I was feeling. So by drawing the self-portrait, I was able to delve into these fears and, and anxieties and all these emotions I was feeling. And <laughs> although I don't, you know, most I move past all those anxieties and fears, um, I still continue to do self-portraits today because somehow I'm able to connect a little better with what I'm working on. In 2003, I gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl, and <laughs> despite, I, fortunately I had that studio process of making the time and making the space in place. So I was able to sustain working. I wasn't going to let motherhood keep me out of the studio. And I remember a friend coming over and saying, how do you... How do you keep doing this? You have all these babies and you're still making drawings. 
And I sort of cheekily but very sincerely responded, I, my pencils and paper are way cheaper than therapy. And <laughs> I, what I, I explained that I have to externalize like, all these, like this pressure, I externalize it and put it out into these drawings and, and sort of let it go. And um, all these anxieties related to, like I said, motherhood, and even into fear about the environment and the world, and even delving back into my own personal history. Uh, this drawing, titled Cottonmouth and Magnolia, is about the relationship between me and my grandmother. This is the same grandmother who carefully noted on all my drawings my exact age. Um, and this is the same grandmother that would drive me around her small South Carolina town to the bank or the Piggly Wiggly and tell the bank teller, the checkout girl, the Piggly Wiggly, Piggly Wiggly my grades, any honors, awards, all these things proudly as if this was some major accomplishment. But this was also the same woman who once told me those colored people should get their own Bible, their own religion, and not use ours. And even as a small child, I had trouble reconciling this kind of racist talk and, and ideology with this woman who I loved and cared for so deeply. She died in 2008, and I started this drawing shortly after her death to work through some of this. And the magnolias in the drawing billow down in the shape of a heart. And her face is calm. This is a death portrait. And my hands are tied by that serpent, unable to change what cannot be changed, you know, proceeding through that field of thorny cotton. And the interesting thing about working, this personal process of putting pencil onto paper is so much goes through my mind while I'm working. Images, words, stories. And while working on this one, I kept having this, the words love and hate, love and hate, love and hate. And I had this image of Robert Mitchum's hands in the movie Night of the Hunter, love and hate tattooed across, which led into this image of the same movie, Shelley Winter's hair billowing around. And uh, that's the sort of imagery that comes to me while I'm working on a piece like this. The interesting thing about that personal process in creating is the act uh, allows you to, to um, just a <laughs> process and, and a look at personal, deep felt, deep, uh, deeply felt conflicts and emotions and sort through these. And it's really a rewarding process. This is a series of self-portraits in war paint across the surface of the drawing. And while working on this piece, my immediate family and I were dealing with uh, some extreme and unpredictable behavior from a relative who's mentally ill. And each of these portraits documents my interactions with that relative. There was acquiescence and a sort of introversion and then confrontation, this tete-a-tete. -tete. And there's a gradual emotional shift there from obedience towards a sort of defiance and anger as protective mother and wife. And these drawings are stitched into a larger drawing with a cottage, this idealized, romantic, unattainable, illusory sense of home. And throughout that are these animals, beaded, nightmarish animals that flow and flutter in and, in and out, animating that sense of anxiety. And needless to say, working on a piece like this is a really healing process as an artist. So much frustration goes into every bead, every stitch, every mark, and it's an obsessive and kind of ritualistic and, and self-absorbed process that allows me to sort through a lot of emotions. We have a studio tour in my town in New Jersey every year, and this woman comes, she's come every year to my studio, and several years ago she pulls me aside, she's like, Sarah, you know I love your drawings, I come here every year, but I have to tell you, I could never live with or own one of these things. They're just, it's too intense. 
I had a very, you know, emotionally traumatic childhood, and they take me there. But I have to come every year. She's very apologetic. And while not the most lucrative patron, uh, <laughs> what was interesting was it was one of the most affirming conversations I'd ever had with a viewer because it made me realize that by delving into this emotional terrain, I was able to create this thing, this object, that she found also emotionally affecting. But I don't think about the viewer while I'm in the studio. For me, it's that personal process of making this thing, you know, it's fortuitous if the viewer can come along for the ride, but for the most part, it's, it's that process. And I have to trust and hope that this thing, this object I make, is something that the viewer will find affecting. and that the viewer will connect to. Because when we connect to a work of art, that art can heal. Art, <laughs> art opens, opens us up to emotions that we would not choose to confront. It can, it can challenge, it can reinforce, it can identify and label, and you know, reassemble emotions in a way that can help us better live with our internal selves. And with that said, art doesn't have to be challenging or confront. No, of course not. It can just be something beautiful that sits on the wall and speaks to us with calmness and serenity. I believe, I firmly believe that anyone with the innate desire to create artwork can do so. Anyone. You don't need a degree. You, your artwork doesn't need to be validated by an editor or curator or gallery or critic. What you make doesn't even have to be good or sellable. It's that process of creating that is so enjoyable and transformative. And, you know, there's so many, there are millions of people in the world today who, whose names will never go down in the art history canon, whose lives are just enriched by that process of making things. So if you thought, I don't want to do this, I want to draw, I want to paint, I want to, you know, I want to make music, there's no reason not to do it. Anyone can do it. And it's that process that can be so rewarding for you. It's making the time and making the space for that process to happen. And I can tell you that daily routine and that process has been rewarding for me. It's been therapeutic. And that's a great thing because my pencils and paper are a lot cheaper than therapy.